So thank you for coming, everyone. Um, you know, it didn't dawn on me until right now that even when there's not cold calling, everybody still moves to the back, and I don't know uh, why that is. But uh, at any rate, um, I just wanted to thank everybody for helping to participate. I'm Dave Rodkey. I helped organize on behalf of the American Constitution Society. Um, but this particular event was co-sponsored with um, the IPI, uh, which Professor Dangle runs. Uh, it was co-sponsored by the OPCD, who passed out, I believe, some information on clerkships, if anyone's interested. Uh, the Federalist Society uh, were instrumental in helping to put this together, um, helping to contribute a substantial amount to everybody's food. Um, uh, also contributing are uh, BALSA, the International Law Society, um, the American Association for Justice, and I'm one slipping my mind because I sent out the, who's the other one that I, Pit Law Dems. Thanks, Kara. I knew I should have kept a note card. Um, but, uh, you know, such overwhelming support uh, was really just an email away. So for the 1Ls and 2Ls who are still around and want to do cool events like this, um, just ask the SBA for the spreadsheet of uh, other organization leaders, and you too can have events with non-pizza food and a panel of experts and all of these great things. So uh, my great hope is that people carry that forward. And without further ado, I want to turn this over to Professor Allen, who will introduce all of our speakers. So thank you, everyone. Bravo. Thank you, Dave. And really, shout out to Dave, who organized this whole thing. Fantastic. <laughs> and Julie, and Julie. OK, so um, here's the plan. Uh, we're going to get very quickly to hearing from our four speakers, because I really want to hear what they have to say. Uh, and they're going to talk for about 10 minutes apiece. And then we're going to have a good amount of time for your questions and just a conversation about what I mean. I've never seen a panel on this topic at a law school, and I've been to many panels. So I think this is fabulous. Um, before, really quickly, before I introduce them and tell you who they clerk for, though, it occurred to me that, um, you know, judicial clerkships are not really a household name kind of occupation. Personally, I had spent a year in law school when someone mentioned one to me, and I was like, what is that clerkship? I had no idea. So on the off chance that some of you here are in that situation, I thought I would really um, succinctly <laughs> tell you something about what they are. So first off, a judicial clerkship, clerking for a judge, it's a full-time job that a lawyer does. We have here from the law school internships that you can do while you're a student in judges' chambers. All good, definitely do them. Uh, but a clerkship is really a professional job that you do after you graduated from law school. And so what do clerks do? Well, you're about to hear from four, uh, something about that. But in a nutshell, you help the judge. You help the judge usually with reading, writing, and analysis of legal issues, as well as some other things. Anything that helps your judge adjudicate the issues in the case in front of her uh, and express that decision, write the opinions. That's what clerks do. Um, so, uh, there are clerks not only at Supreme Courts, but at courts of all levels, trial courts, intermediate appellate courts, and high courts in the U.S., and as you'll hear from our panelists more specifically, in other countries and on international courts like the ICC, the International Criminal Court, or the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and there are two basic models of employment for clerks that I'm aware of in the US. Uh, one is a professional civil service model. And that's typical of, of state courts. People are judges, clerks, in, for indefinite employment, a kind of job like a lawyer would have in public, in a public office of any kind. But the second model is more typical of federal courts. And it is the model that I think all four of our speakers followed, and that's a clerkship that's done usually either right out of law school or shortly after, after just a couple of years in practice, though that second model is becoming more um, common now. For a year or two, it's like a fellowship, if you like, where you go and 
you are part of a judge's chambers, usually with one, two, or three other clerks, and together you work for a year or two with a judge working on these cases. So um, that's the nutshell of the generic <laughs> clerk model. If it interests you, and especially after you hear from them, I mean, my students know that I'm constantly saying, go get a clerkship. There are clerkships for everyone in courts all over of various different levels of different degrees of competitiveness to get. And if you want a clerkship, you can probably get one if you really pursue it. And the two clerkships I did, I have to say, are the two best jobs I ever had short of this one. So <laughs> now, to hear more of the inside story, and, and you know, part of the reason clerkships are cloaked in mystery is that not only institutionally, who knows what that is, but because of the confidentiality, right? There, when, <laughs> when a judge decides a case and you're a clerk, a law clerk to that judge working with them, you know, mum's the word. You're not out there telling other people what your judge is thinking or deciding. Um, sometimes uh, after history goes by for a while, uh, some of that confidentiality can disappear, sometimes not. Anyway, so now you're about to hear from these four people. I mentioned that there are clerkships on courts of all different levels, but all four of these people, speakers, uh, clerked on high courts, courts who are at the top of the judicial pyramid, who have the last word on any one of the issues that they're deciding, unless they choose, of course, to send it back to somebody else. So who are they and who do they clerk for? Well, our first speaker is our incoming dean here at Pitt Law, in Amy Wildemuth. Uh, she's coming to us from the University of Utah, yay! where she actually was in the general university administration as well as a law professor there. Her scholarship in teaching is in the area of civil procedure, admin law, administrative law, and environmental law. Dean Wildemuth actually had three clerkships. Two were on intermediate courts of appeals, one for Harry Edwards on the DC circuit and another for Guido Calabresi on the second circuit after which she clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens on the US Supreme Court. Okay, our second speaker, uh, Professor Bernie Hibbets, legal historian. Um, Professor Hibbets had a, a somewhat peripatetic student career. He went to about five different law schools in Canada, England, and the United States. They include Dalhousie, Harvard, and Oxford. Um, after which he uh, clerked, he was chosen as a law clerk uh, for the Chief Justice of the Canadian Supreme Court, Justice Borolaskin. And he then clerked for incoming Justice Gerald Ledain after Justice Laskin died in office. So he has quite a story to tell there. I should say that besides being a legal historian and teaching courses on the history of the legal profession in the US and in the ancient world, Professor Hibbets runs Jurist here at Pitt. Uh, third speaker, Professor Matienge Sirleaf is here a professor who teaches in the areas of criminal law and international law. She's taught at a few other law schools before coming to us a few years ago here. And after she graduated from law school, uh, she, clerked, she was a, a law clerk to Chief Justice Sandile Kobo. I do that because I can't click with my tongue. It's a click in the, in the, <laughs> in the language. And so uh, she, he was at the time Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. All right, and then finally, rounding out the program, we have Professor Stephanie Dangle. Stephanie runs, she's the executive director of the Innovation Practice Institute here at Pitt. Um, after she graduated from law school, she had two clerkships, one for Judge Pierre Laval, who at the time was on the trial court of the Southern District of New York. Judge Laval currently sits on the Second Circuit. Um, 
And then after that, she clerked for Justice Blackmun on the US Supreme Court. So without further ado, let's get the program started and kick it off with Dean Wildermuth. All right, so uh, let me tell you a few things about uh, working uh, for Justice Stevens. And I am open, I have to tell you, to any questions that anybody has. Uh, I clerked for Justice Stevens in October term 2002. That's the hip way to say I worked there from July 2002 till about July 2003. But we say October terms, or, or if you're really cool, OT, <laughs> O2. OK, so that's when I was there. Um, and I have a few uh, lessons that I learned. Uh, I'm going to share with you five of them um, from the great Justice Stevens. So we have to say Justice Stevens is going to turn. Anybody know? I should have like prizes. How old will Justice Stevens turn this year? This year, he'll be 98. 98. And what day? <laughs> A April 20th. April 20th. And how do I know that? Because it's my dad's birthday. <laughs> I tell you, it's a funny world, right? OK. So one of the big things that I learned as a clerk is that there is really some power to that 10,000 hours Malcolm Gladwell to become expert at something, right? Uh, we kept thinking, you know, here's all this mound, there are mounds and mounds of work. And when you do work at the Supreme Court, at the US Supreme Court, there's different types of things that clerks do. So let me just identify, right, what those piles are. The first pile are the cert petitions, OK? The cert petitions are people asking the Supreme Court to hear their case. Now, for more fun, how many of those do you think that we have every year? How many petitions for cert? Anybody up on your numbers? For, should I ask census data next? No, I'm just kidding. OK, so it's about, it's somewhere between eight and 10,000. And it, it keeps increasing. It's increased a bit uh, since I was there. Uh, and there's quite a difference in what we have in that docket because you have a number of unpaid cases. Those are pro se folks asking the court to hear their case. And then there's the paid petitions. And the paid petitions come in and they're real pretty, right? And the p folks who are pro se are coming in just Xerox copies. Um, so in Justice Stevens' chambers, we didn't get to share that work. So there were four of us. And we did all of the cert petitions for Justice Stevens. So that was a big chunk of our work. The other stuff that you know about from listening to NPR, Nina Totenberg, or you know wherever you prefer to get your news, Nina Totenberg would be a good, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we, right, we, we know that there are merits cases in, in addition to this. And that's what a lot of people are paying attention to. In our case, right, with Justice Stevens, we didn't have as much work to do on the merits cases. We did a lot of cert work. We did some prep work with Justice Stevens um, before argument. And then most of our work on merits cases was if he got assigned the opinion or if he assigned himself the opinion, if he was the senior justice in the majority. Um, the other thing that was uh, a little more of the workload when I was there were the stays in the execution. So there was, a big, there was a much heavier docket in terms of executions. That was actually a reason that I did not apply originally to the Supreme Court. And I'm happy to talk about that um, more if anybody would like me to. But we had a little bit more of a, of a time commitment. There's not as much now, because I'm sure everybody's kept up to date on what's been happening, right? Can't get the medication so the, uh, or the, the drugs, right? Uh, and so that's become a little thinner slice of what clerks do, or at least the clerks that talk to me about it. And then there's some other stuff you do for the justice. Uh, I was going to say this is their personal stuff, but then you think like I ran to like the dry cleaner for Justice Stevens, which he would never have me do. So it's not that kind of stuff. It's if they're working on a book. So Justice Breyer had a book that he was working on the year I was there. His clerks were helping him with that. Any speeches, any journal articles, those kinds of things we were working on for the justice. So that was basically the lineup. Um, and I always thought, wow, this is a ton of work, right? Uh, and one, one particular moment stands out in my sort of term with Justice Stevens. And that was when we really learned that Chief Justice Rehnquist loves to bet. Did you know this? 
Oh, right. He, he, he's somebody who likes to bet on things. This was a very big deal. So we had a few different kinds of pools, all for fun, never in violation of any laws whatsoever, <laughs> at the Supreme Court. And we might have had something that was going on around college football playoffs. And my co-clerk and I, Eric Olson, happened to be doing very well in that pool. And so we told Justice Stevens, we think we really need to watch those games. And Justice Stevens, to his credit, said, yes, you do. Don't get your memos in until those games are done. you got to beat the chief. So as if we could have some role, right, just by watching. Anyway, so we turned in a bunch of memos. He gave us permission to turn in our memos on a Monday morning when typically we'd have them in before that, and we gave him a pile of them, about 23, if I recall. And we thought, oh. <gasps> Oh boy, how's he ever going to get through 23? This was so terrible. How could we? And so he took all 23 into his office. And then about an hour later, he came back out and they were all done. And then we realized Justice Stevens didn't actually need clerks. We we're just there, right, to entertain him because he could do it all on his own. So he knew, right, what he wanted to do in all these cases, but he took them back and, uh, you know, really showed us how quickly one can do things if you're expert. And in fact, uh, by the time uh, Justice Ste I was there with Justice Stevens, he made the following joke, right? So everybody is aware that the Supreme Court docket has declined over time. Well, Justice Stevens was there during that decline. So the case load when he started was around 150. By the time I clerked for him, it was closer to between 70 and 80. And so his running joke was, that he didn't know he had taken senior justice status, which meant he got a half load, right? So he thought this was pretty funny. So one of the things, right, was that once you become expert, and this is very, very hard, right, when you're starting out, but once you become expert, you really do know things, and trust me, those justices are experts. Um, the second thing, right, uh, was that I learned a bit about the flaws and always playing strategically. So one of the things Justice Stevens was well known for was his lack of strategy when granting cert petitions. Much to the you know, uh, great, great anxiety of his clerks. But Justice Stevens would have us read through those cert petitions and just tell him, is this a question on which there is a conflict, right, that the Supreme Court, it's a big and important question that the Supreme Court needs to resolve. And if it met that criteria, he didn't care if he was going to lose, ultimately, right? He just thought, OK, I'll vote to grant cert. And we would say to him, but Justice, aren't you worried that you might lose? Because you only need four to grant cert, five to win, four to grant cert, five to win. And we'd say, Justice, aren't you worried? What if you lose? And he said, ah, oh, you just never know how this goes. We, we, just, we just have to throw the dice and we see where it lands, right? I've been doing this a long time. Sometimes I win, sometimes I lose. Eh. Thank goodness Justice Breyer is strategic. OK, anyway. Um, so then uh, the other one is the importance of a personal relationship. Um, I have to say that's a big lesson that I learned about the cert pool. The cert pool is somewhat controversial. That's where justices share their clerks to go through cert petitions. Justice Stevens did not, as I said at the beginning, share clerks. We just went through the whole stack of cert petitions. So those 8,000 or 10,000, right, we went through them. There were four of us to divide, right? We can do that. Um, so I did about 2,000. OK. Um, whew, still weighs heavy. Anyway, um, so we got, you know, we, we had a bird's eye view, right, of that cert pool and what happens. There's lots of different theories about this, and again, in the Rest of the time, we can talk a bit more about this. But my take is that when you have a bunch of very eager, new, non-expert people serving as clerks, and you have them write memos for people who are not their bosses, they all become very cautious, very little C conservative. And for my money, that is why we don't have 150 cases being heard by the Supreme Court now. We have very, very small numbers of cases. And by the way, it hasn't reduced the number of pages in opinions. <laughs> Another fascinating thing for all law students, and I know you really appreciate it, right? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, 
How about uh, being kind and always assuming uh, what, what Justice Stevens would assume, which was inadvertence or inattention, as opposed to intentional malice? Um, a lot of times in life, when things happen that you weren't expecting, and they may have really upset you, you get a choice. You get to decide that that was done to be mean to you, or you get to decide that maybe that was something that was the function of inattention, right, or something else, that there wasn't that intentional malice behind it. What I learned from Judge Edwards, from Guido Calabresi, and from Justice Stevens in particular, is the importance of not assuming malicious intent or malice, right, at the first instance of something going wrong. And that is a way that you can serve and you can be long serving on a court with repeat players, right? Those folks weren't going to change. And so if you start to assume those bad things, right, it was not going to work out well. I'll also say that this came uh, in, this was very, very important um, with me when I interviewed because I mentioned that my dad shares the same birthday, not the same age, but the same birthday with Justice Stevens. And when I sat down to do my interview, you know, Justice Stevens hired a lot of people from the Midwest. And I'm sure you can hear that Chicago accent still in that voice, right? So I'm from Chicago, and my folks uh, were public educators. And my dad was a high school principal in a place called Downers Grove. He was the high school principal at Downers Grove North. Justice Stevens was from Chicago, but I didn't really know where his kids or his grandkids lived. So I sit down to have my interview, and he says, oh, your dad's a principal. What, what high school is it? I said, Downers Grove North. He said, oh, my great-grandkids go there. And I thought in that moment, my dad better have not have done anything. <laughs> OK. So I still ended up with a job, right? Again, don't assume a malice. Um, the last thing I'll say is that Justice Stevens, right, um, always knew the value of a good exit, which is what I think we're all hoping I'll do now, right? So the good exit here, the good exit strategy that I learned uh, came in two forms. Uh, one was that every year when Justice Stevens got new clerks, just as if Justice Stevens walked in here, right, you, you have to resist the temptation not to bow down, right? You're, you're in the room with someone who is a great presence who doesn't carry himself in that way, by the way, right? But you know you're with somebody who's really famous. I don't spend a lot of time with famous people, so I didn't quite know what to do. I kept backing up. I didn't know, right? I mean, it was very awkward. But don't worry. By the time we leave that chambers, we're saying, Justice, you can't do this. You, no, no, we're not going to do it. No, Justice, that, that, we're not going to do that. And that's about the time that Justice Stevens says, you know, do you think my new clerks are coming soon. <laughs> so I have to say, uh, what Justice Stevens taught me of those many things, uh, we have a saying, all the Justice Stevens clerks. And we would say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify it in just a second. And this started with Teresa uh, Roseborough, who's a great, great attorney in Atlanta. And she said, you know, if Justice Stevens quits his job and opens a gas station, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to pump gas. Now, because I do sustainability, I'm going to change it just a little bit. So here it is. <laughs> if Justice Stevens quits his job and he starts installing solar, I'm up on that roof putting those solar panels in. So anyway, so thank you so much. I will turn it over now. I've, um, I've decided to use slides because I presume that not too many people in this room are familiar with the institution about which I will be speaking. Uh, which is the, uh, the Canadian Supreme Court. So I'm going to bring down the lights and we're going to have a chat uh, about all this. Um, and hopefully um, I can even find some notes. Uh, so welcome to Ottawa, Ontario. This is the Supreme Court of Canada in winter, uh, quite appropriately perhaps. Um, and if you enter into the building, you'll see a rather remarkable great hall. That's fine. Uh, but the actual courtroom is quite small. It's a sort of intimate space full of Canadian maple, red, that kind of thing. Um, and you may be interested in knowing that the proceedings of this court are televised. They've been televised for about the last 23 years or so. 
Uh, I, I hear that they're not televised here yet. <laughs> but, um, but nonetheless, uh, if we go in this direction, this is a precedent. Okay, and you can see here the Canadian lawyers with their gowns and their tabs, and I have a set of these at home, although I haven't had occasion to wear them recently. Uh, you'll see them arguing with the Supreme Court or before the Supreme Court or at the Supreme Court. And here are the judges of the Supreme Court, and you may notice something rather remarkable about these people, because uh, almost half of them are women. Uh, so you've got four women in this particular picture. This is from about a year or so ago, two years ago, I guess. And at the time, the Chief Justice of Canada was also a woman. Uh, now she's been replaced by a male judge uh, from Quebec. Uh, obviously, we have law clerks. That's why I'm talking about this today. Uh, there are 36 positions available. The judges now have four clerks each, similar to the arrangement that uh, Dean Wildermuth uh, uh, described for us. But back in my time, which I'm sorry to say is a lot further back than, than uh, Dean Wildermuth's time, uh, that was not the case. Uh, so we're talking now about the early 1980s, all right? We're going way back. And we're going back to a time when there were only 12 clerks at the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, those clerks were split amongst the various justices. The, the French Canadian justices had fewer clerks generally than the English Canadian justices had. But it was a time of change. And it was a time of change because we were shifting in Canada from a system of legislative supremacy, where parliament ruled and had the last say, to a system of judicial supremacy where the courts decided what your rights were. This is fundamental. This is like being at the United States Supreme Court when John Marshall is deciding Marbury versus Madison. All right? So this was a time of profound change, and it put the Canadian Supreme Court in the spotlight in a way that had never happened before. They still had decided cases previously. They still had significant power. But now they really had a lot of power because they could decide that something was void and null and of no legal effect, something that Parliament had done. Well, here's a picture of my first boss. This is Bora Laskin, the Chief Justice of Canada. I'd heard about law clerks when I was at Oxford, and somebody suggested that I should apply for a position. I thought, well, what the heck, it's only a stamp. I'll do that. There's no really, at this point, any coordinated interview program or anything else like this. It's all very informal. So I sent in my stamp and my application, and I got a call from Ottawa one day um, when I was back at Dalhousie, which, which uh, Jesse uh, pronounced correctly, um, telling me that I should come to the Supreme Court, and if I came, I would be interviewed by this man, the Chief Justice of Canada. Now, I'm just fresh out of law school. All right, so this is an experience, going back to something that Amy had said. So I went to, went to the court. Uh, I got a few minutes before the interview with Laskin to actually walk in the courtroom into the chamber, which you just saw, which is a rather good thing because I'd never been in a courtroom before, honestly. <laughs> so that was an experience. I thought, well, I got something out of this trip. And then I go and see <laughs> Chief Justice Laskin. And Chief Justice Laskin, at this point, is ill. All right? He is in declining health. He was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1970. He was a Jewish justice. He was the first chief justice to be a Jew in Canadian history, remarkable at that time, um, because our population of Jews is not that great. And he had a remarkable legacy in terms of civil rights rulings, things like that. Very, very bright man. But he was suffering from a variety of ailments at this point. And then he had something else to deal which, with, which was this, this charter of rights, which sort of doubled, tripled, quadrupled his workload. And he was failing under that. And it was very clear when I saw him that he wasn't doing that well. He, his clothes didn't fit him well. He was a little man in the big doorway. But we had a great talk. And he pointed at one stage in the interview to a table in the corner of the room and said, that, Mr. Hibbets, is the Charter of Rights, because it was piled high with cases that were about to come to the Supreme Court. They'd been already granted leave to appeal, and now they were going to come before the court. Unfortunately, Bora Laskin did not live to hear any of those cases. He died in office, as Professor Allen mentioned, before they came up. And so in March of 1984, I found myself technically unemployed. So in that sort of circumstance, when a justice of the Supreme Court dies, uh, his clerks are sort of willed, transmitted to the new occupant of the position. Now, there was a new chief justice, but he had his own clerks because he'd already been a justice on the Supreme Court of Canada. He just brought his own existing clerks with him. Uh, a new justice was, however, appointed. This was Justice Gerald Dane, the new kid on the block, basically, a former federal court judge. 
uh, most famous in Canada uh, for his uh, work as commissioner on the um, uh, study of the non-medical use of drugs, which had actually recommended legalization of marijuana in Canada in 1973. The Canadian government has recently taken uh, an official position on this, uh, implementing the, the findings of the report. Um, but anyway, he was ahead of his time. He was remarkable, all right? A remarkable man, former law school dean, as I said, former judge, uh, lots of experience, uh, handsome guy, uh, articulate, passionate, enthusiastic. He had everything going for him, everything going for him. And we were excited to work with him. He was the next best thing to Bore Alaska, and if you couldn't have Bore Alaska. So, as clerks, we got to work. There were two of us. Um, my friend Bruce Ryder, who's now a professor at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto. Uh, and this is where we worked. We worked in the Supreme Court Library, which was underneath the roof of the Supreme Court building, that big bronze roof, which is hot as heck in the summertime. Uh, no air conditioning, really. But we worked in there, and we struggled with the charter. We struggled with this new document that nobody knew what to do with. Uh, and this was a political problem. It was a social problem. It was a legal problem. And I remember sitting in the Supreme Court Library, right in here, with a colleague of mine who was a clerk for a French-Canadian justice, and we had piles of American reports on our table. Because somebody thought, quite logically, that maybe the American Bill of Rights and the interpretation thereof could provide precedent for rulings on the Canadian Charter. The terms of different structure is different, but there's a start. So Laurent Marcoux and I are talking about this, and we've got these cases piled up. But we don't know what a West Key number is. We've never heard of shepherdizing. Now, maybe you haven't either, I don't know. But in either of them, we haven't got a clue. And we basically sat there and said to each other, we have no idea what we're doing, but we're going to do it anyway. So we did our best to come up with recommendations to our judges. So like Dean Wildermuth said, we worked on what you would call certiorari applications, leave to appeal, as we called them. Uh, we would write bench memos for our judges on cases that had been granted leave to appeal that were going to be before the court. Uh, we would not draft opinions in any context at all. We didn't write speeches because our judges were not really public figures at all. They didn't write books. They didn't do any of that. That's now changing, but at this time period, none of that was taking place. So that's what we did. Now, what was Ladane like to work with? He was terrific to work with, but he was intense as heck. Okay, he was a really vital, dynamic, bright guy who was very conscious of responsibility. He knew that he was now the last word. What the judges of the Supreme Court decided would be law. There was no further appeal beyond it. We weren't taking appeals to the Privy Council of London anymore. We weren't going across the Atlantic. We weren't doing anything like that. He was now the last word. And he worked so hard, he used to tell us that he would get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to start to work and write. And we would believe him. And we were just in awe of this guy. He was amazing. But he also had a sense of humor, right? I mean, have you ever seen a Supreme Court clerk, Canadian or American, uh, have a discussion with a, a law clerk, uh, a Supreme Court judge, rather, have a discussion with a law clerk, uh, and then sort of lurch Quasimodo like back into his office? Because he obviously feels like you know he's chained to his desk, and he's got too much to do. I mean, so there was a. There was a twinkle in his eye. There was something about him that you just had to like. You just had to like this man. But he worked like a Trojan. He just slaved. He just pushed. He pushed. He pushed. And it took a toll. And this is a picture of Justice Ledane with his other justices at the Supreme Court about two years after I left. And I was actually struck this afternoon in, in choosing this slide because you can see in his face he's already starting to look a bit gone. So Jerry, as we always called him, never to his face, but as we always called him, um, uh, and act, uh, he just pushed himself too hard at the end of the day. He pushed himself too hard, and he ended up, given the crushing weight of the charter, and given other things that were happening in his family at the time, deaths of close family members, things like that, he ended up in 1987, basically, with um, a clinical depression diagnosis. And he was hospitalized. And he had to take a leave of absence from the court. Now, this put the court in a terrible position because the court was facing this huge, humongous caseload, which I suggest had already helped to kill Bore Alaska and my previous boss. And now, Jerry was going to get it. 
Jerry was next. Jerry was being crushed by the same charter that had killed Moore Alaska. And so what do you do if you're the chief? Well, you want him to get well maybe so and probably so you give him three months off. Under the Judges Act as it would existed in Canada at the time, you could do that. So Jerry got three months off. But he wasn't recovering enough. This was tough. This was a hard thing for him in so many ways. And he was fighting it. He was really fighting it. But he was still incapacitated. So his wife ended up going to the Supreme Court to plead her husband's case. Think of the irony of this. To plead her husband's case with the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who is Brian Dixon, the gentleman in the middle right there, who's an old World War II veteran, tough as nails. And she asked for an extension, basically. Could he have a bit more time? Could something be done? Maybe they could hire some more clerks. Maybe there'd be some, there could be something done that would at least take a little bit of burden off him, and then he'd be back, and then he'd be good as new, and then he could go on. And Chief Justice Dixon, or Alaskan successor, said no. And he asked for Gerald Ladane's resignation. So Gerald Ladane was forced off the court at the age of 64. He did eventually recover, but he never worked again. The court, meanwhile, started to erase some of the things that he'd actually done on the court. The last case he was working on, which was a case on Bill 101, a language bill for the province of Quebec, challenging its constitutionality. He had written a draft of that judgment. We call them judgments in Canada, not opinions. We're very sure of ourselves. <laughs> so in that context, in that context, he'd written this draft, but his name was taken off it. He was left with a little asterisk, with asterisk which said, Justice Ledane did not participate in the decision. And the court went on its merry way. And they continued to produce judgments, and they continued to churn out what they needed to churn out to get the charter interpreted, and it was all fine. But Jerry was pushed to the side. And as one of my fellow clerks said later on, the whole business punctured his soul punctured his soul. So here's Jerry in retirement, basically, in the Gatineau Hills, which he loved to ski on after his retirement. But he was brought low by this in so many ways. The court didn't talk about this much at the time. Now, maybe the court, and maybe the chief, was protecting Justice Levine. Or maybe it was protecting itself by not wanting this story to get out. So there was confusion in the press. There were rumors that there was something going on with Justice Levine, that he had some depressive, depressive mental illness or something, but it was never substantiated. And as I said, it was never really talked about. But now it's being talked about, because we're 30 years later, 30 years on. And in press at the moment, at McGill-Queens University Press in Montreal, is a book on Gerald Ledane, quite fittingly, because Gerald Ledane uh, was a graduate of the McGill Law School. And in this book, some of us come to grips or try to come to grips with what happened to Jerry Ledane and whether what happened to Jerry Ledane was the right course of action. And I had the honor to write the preface to this book, which will shortly be published. While this book was still in preparation, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the National Broadcasting Corporation, the public broadcaster in Canada, got a hold of it. And they produced a very powerful radio documentary telling Jerry's story for the first time, interviewing the people who were close to him, interviewing people who were on the court at the time, all talking about how depression changed this judge's life and how unfair in many respects was the treatment that he received from his own chief. So this was remarkable. This happened just, I guess, a couple of months ago, January. And the CBC, in the wake of this program, got so much mail, they actually did a follow-up program a couple of weeks later. And people came forward, and they were shocked, and they were unhappy, and they were dismayed. I mean, it's a different time now, right? We think about depression differently than we did 30 years ago. We're not quite so rough on it anymore. We're more sympathetic. People thought, at the very least, his name should be put back on judgments. Some people even said that Justin Trudeau, in his spare time, should actually go and apologize to, Ledane, to the Ladane family for what was done. And that wouldn't be unfitting because it was Justin Trudeau's father who appointed 
Jerry Ledane to the Supreme Court in the first place. So there's now a cry in Canada for this wrong to be righted. But yet there is a controversy because you could still say that however difficult it was for Jerry, the chief still did the right thing. So the jury is out. The debate will continue. So here's the, the follow-up story on the CBC. Having said all this, regardless of which position you take in all of this, what I learned in this process when I was at the court, after I was at the court, was that judges are human beings. Yes, they're brilliant. That's why they're there. Yes, they're articulate. That's why they're there. But they're human beings. They struggle with things, just like all of us do. And they pay very high prices. Considering that, remembering that, my favorite picture of Jerry Ledane is not, you know, the official court portrait that you saw on the screen a few minutes ago with the books and the great Canadian red judicial robes and the ermine and all of that taken in the chambers of the judge. It's this picture, which is just Jerry sitting on his desk or a table in his home. He's just come back from receiving the Order of Canada. This is 1991. This is our highest civilian honor. And it's at least a measure of recognition for what he did. It's a start. But he's, he's there, and he's just a man, just a person. He's sitting there with his crumpled suit, his shoulders slightly hunched. But he still has a gleam in his eye. He still has pens in his pocket as if he's going to write another judgment, if only he were asked to do it. He's ready to serve. But yet he's not able because he's been told he can't. So this is the Jerry Ledane I remember. And for all the things I learned when I was in his chambers, I learned the most about him and about the importance of judging from the perspective of character and perseverance and struggle. And I learned that judging was an exercise in humanity. That's it. Perfect. Uh, well, hi, everybody. Uh, tough acts to follow. Um, I should say that I uh, clerked at the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, and so I'll test, like Amy did. Uh, anybody can tell me where the Constitutional Court is located in South Africa? Any idea? Guesses? Guess you don't count. Yeah, Chris? So no. Cape Town or Pretoria? No. Yes. Johannesburg. Johannesburg. All right. OK. So uh, you probably have little to no information about this court. So what I thought that I would do is actually try to provide some information about uh, the Constitutional Court of South Africa, which is the apex court in uh, South Africa, which is located in Johannesburg, South Africa, and tell you some of the unique features about the court. So one thing that I should say is that the Constitutional Court was created at the time of the transition from apartheid South Africa, uh, which was dominated by um, uh, a white minority-led government, to majority rule. Right. So the institution was created as part of a negotiated transition to a more democratic dispensation in South Africa. And I think because of that, uh, the Bill of Rights, as sort of the constitutive uh, document, is far more imaginative in terms of its vision of law as a facilitator of social change. And I think the jurists on the court are also committed to law as a progressive means in sort of changing the lived realities of people's lives in ways in which um, inspired me to go to the court. So you guys, from your experience on US constitutional law, are obviously familiar with civil and political rights, protection from um, arbitrary arrest, uh, all of the criminal procedure um, uh, guarantees that go into civil and political rights and beyond that, uh, access to courts and so on and so forth. But quite remarkably, the South African Constitution and its Bill of Rights incorporate socio and economic rights, right? And so the right to health, for example, the right to education, the right to um, the environment are included in the Bill of Rights as justiciable rights, right? Not as things that are sort of niceties. Uh, you might be familiar uh, with sort of state constitutions in the US, which incorporate things like the right to education and the right to health, but we don't have that, at least here, as, as a national thing. 
So one of the things about the Constitutional Court and the Bill of Rights in particular is that it's actually a radical document, right? It's one of the most progressive constitutions in uh, the world, and that, in part, is because it's one of the newest uh, constitutions in the world, right? So having the benefit of history and learning from um, others and, and trying to build upon the experience of others um, is reflected in the, in the Constitutional Court itself as an institution, and then the Bill of Rights, which the jurists on the court are seeking to um, enforce and, and, and make real. And so the other thing that I would say about the judges, the judges that came onto the court, the founding judges of the court, were uh, many of them involved in the anti-apartheid uh, struggle. Right, so uh, the idea that sort of judges are sort of neutral and removed from political um, action is something that is um, not even a pretense, right? In in uh, South Africa, right? So the background of the jurists informed their approach to the law when they were on the court. And they saw their mission as actually trying to transform uh, South African society to match the vision within the Constitution and to, to, to make this a reality uh, for, for South Africans. And so I clerked for Chief Justice Sandile Ngobo. Um, not, <laughs> but, but we practice. So I told her she could also just sort of pan to me and then I would say it. But anyway, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> she wanted to snap, so here we have it. Um, so I clerked for him at a time of transformation in the court, right? So the four, some, some of the four founding judges of the court were retiring during the year that I was on the court, which is 2009. And so there was all this trepidation about uh, some of the progressive um, jurisprudence that had come out of the court, whether the court was actually going to be able to maintain its legacy. So you might wonder, uh, you know, what in the world was I doing um, in South Africa, and how was I actually even clerking on this court? Um, well, first, I'm not South African. Uh, so South Africa has a foreign clerks program. Uh, and well, I applied for that program. And one of the things that motivated me to do that, this, of course, the illustrious history of the court's jurisprudence uh, inspired me. But also, I was wary, as um, our incoming dean mentioned, about uh, being involved in any death penalty cases. Right. So I wanted to be at an institution where I was secure that I wouldn't be involved at all, uh, given my own uh, position on um, on the death penalty. And given that South Africa uh, has abolished the death penalty, I didn't have that moral uh, conflict at all. Uh, and so in working with the court, I was also interested in uh, the fact that South Africa's constitution integrates uh, international law. And so some of you might know that's my area of, of specialty, and in particular, international human rights. Uh, and so I was interested in uh, working in an institution which takes international law seriously, which takes um, foreign uh, law seriously, uh, and looks to knowledge from outside to sort of inform um, how you address concrete issues in, 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 a, in a given situation. Not to say that uh, a native knowledge is, is not important, but native knowledge along with knowledge um, in context from other um, actors who are looking at similar issues is also something that is important. So I wanted to uh, talk to you about one of uh, the cases that had a really informative um, was really informative for me. Uh, and so as I mentioned, the court tries to figure out how do we make sense of social and economic rights as sort of a justiciable thing. And so one of the cases involved uh, a hearing where the government was considering the issue of sanitation. Uh, so sanitation is protected underneath the adequate right to health underneath the Constitution. And it involved an informal settlement which was um, saying that the government was required to provide sanitation to them. And that was what was being determined before the court. Uh, and so the issue was this informal settlement was waiting upon, um, well, formality. Uh, the government is required to provide adequate housing. And the government's position was, well, we are working on providing adequate housing. We don't have that the means to do so yet, but we will do so. And we plan to upgrade. Um, the accommodation for this particular uh, community. And so the provincial government had delayed uh, reviewing this particular application for a number of years. Um, and essentially, this informal settlement was in a legal lacuna, right? Uh, they 
underneath the relevant statutes, they weren't entitled to basic sanitation and other services because they felt in this uh, hole. Um, and they, didn't, they weren't going to get any more protections until they were in the more established uh, housing that the government promised to provide. And so in court that day, uh, large numbers of informal settlers uh, were bust in. Um, I wish I had pictures because the building itself is the most beautiful building I've ever worked in. Um, not that this one isn't, isn't in this brutalist, <laughs> and this brutalist architecture uh, <laughs> is not. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, so uh, that aside, no shade to, to Bitlaw. Um, <laughs> so in, informal uh, settlers were bust into court that day. They filled the entire courtroom. And remarkably, the judge that was representing the government stood up and before addressing the, the, the court with his arguments, apologized, apologized to the court for the governmental delay in providing um, the services. And so I was, as a sort of fresh out of law school, was confused. How can you do that? That's undermining your position. Um, and then the judge, remarkably, the deputy chief judge, chastised the individual for <laughs> apologizing to the jurist as opposed to turning around and apologizing to the members of the community that were gathered, and not only uh, apologizing to them, but doing so in their language, right? In their language so that they can actually understand and so that uh, uh, apology could be meaningful. And so this was remarkable to me because, one, the the lawyer representing the government stepped out of their adversarial role um, for a second uh, to recognize uh, the fault that the government had in sort of this particular delay. Um, what was also remarkable was that something as minuscule, right, as whether adequate sanitation is something that was being debated at, as, a, as, as a matter of constitutional law at the most important court, quite frankly, in, in, in South Africa, um, and as a matter of whether this is an international human rights uh, guarantee. In particular, um, given that underneath apartheid, people were taught in languages that were not uh, their own, uh, the fact that the judge and the court would actually ask um, that counsel speak to people in a way in which they can actually understand and engage helped, I think, to try to bridge the divide that can exist between lawyers and the communities that they pretend, or not pretend, the lawyers that, that, that are actually working on behalf, right? Um, so that you can actually have a representational role, even if you are in uh, sort of an antagonistic position, uh, but in a way in which there is actually uh, engagement and dialogue. And so I thought that this was uh, quite fascinating, because to me, it represented the best of this particular institution. Um, and I had seen nothing like it before in my, um, at that time, very limited uh, experience. The other uh, thing that I wanted to, to, to highlight in terms of the cases that I worked on is uh, given the sort of post-apartheid dispensation of the court, a number of the cases that we were dealing with were related to South Africa's amnesty process that happened following the transition from um, apartheid and this truth and reconciliation process. And so one of the cases that I worked on with my judge uh, is a claim that uh, those who are apartheid era victims brought to say that the government's use of the pardon power, right, the then President Mbeki's use of the pardon power, was a violation of victims' right to be heard because it excluded them from that decision-making process. So essentially, following apartheid, um, the deal was, well, we won't prosecute you if you come through this truth commission process. Uh, but the victims were saying, well, for those who came forward and were denied amnesty, right, who came forward through this truth commission process and were denied amnesty, uh, the deal is those people should be prosecuted, right? Um, if they were denied amnesty, then they need to be prosecuted. And if they are in prison, they shouldn't be pardoned because that sort of undermines the fundamental logics of uh, the negotiated transition. And um, I was involved in that decision, and the judge um, ultimately use sort of the principle of legality to constrain uh, the exercise of the pardon power. And so for those of you who might know, the, you know, the pardon power is something that is largely seen as, uh, you know, the president, well, actually it's 
controversial and topical here today, is it not? And so, <laughs> and so um, but, 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 but most people view the pardon power as something that is sort of immune from uh, too much judicial oversight, too much judicial uh, review. And here you have essentially the court deciding that it had to restrain the use of the pardon power in order not to undermine, um, one, the victim's access to courts, the principle of legality, and the fundamental sort of ne negotiated transition or bargain um, that was done at the, at the court's uh, founding. And so I use these two cases to sort of highlight the role of one, uh, social and economic rights is something that is justiciable to sort of undermine the idea that um, courts have no business here or cannot play any role here because um, even though, of course, the course, court is struggling with its jurisprudence in this area, it is struggling in trying to make social and economic rights a reality for, um, for South Africans. Uh, and then two, to highlight how the court has actually seen itself as part and parcel of the transition to a more democratic uh, dispensation in South Africa and has been used to sort of hold the government to account to the extent that the government sort of forgets or moves away from um, that understanding. And what I think is key for me in terms of both of these is um, thinking about the role of law as a means of furthering uh, justice. The, the jurists that I work for, my judge, and other judges were committed to justice. Of course, all of them had varying views of what that meant, but none of them were not committed to seeing a more just world and working towards a more just order. And so for me, as a young um, practitioner, it was a really fundamental experience in terms of informing my own work and how I approach the law. So I don't see the law as removed from social change or social action. Um, and I don't see judges as sort of vacuums that are not influenced by, by politics or do, who do not have priors, um, experiences, backgrounds that are informing the decisions uh, that they make. And actually love the fact that there isn't um, sort of some veneer that this is not at all informed by um, people's political leanings or, or beliefs. Um, in terms, in terms of uh, the outcomes of different cases or how uh, cases are approached. And so I will say a couple of just quick anecdotes about my judge and then turn it over. Um, I have never worked for a, well actually, okay good, you, I was looking around to see um, whether, whether Chip was in here, but I've never worked for, <laughs> for, a, more, for a more stern, uh, <laughs> for a more stern um, and exacting uh, uh, person than my judge. And I think one of the things about a clerkship is that it trains you in a way in which you will, you will never have an experience like that, right? I wrote a memo for this judge and I just knew that I had just done everything and it was everything. And so I, I gave it to him. It was 75 pages long. <laughs> and I got berated because apparently the 75 pages did not even hit the main issues that were in the case, or at least the main issues that he, that he wanted um, to, have, to have covered. And so it was a humbling experience. Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot uh, in terms of thinking about not only um, what my particular position is, but anticipating what the other side's view is, and also seeing law as not necessarily um, one in which litigation is the primary uh, mode, right? A lot of cases would get resolved prior to reaching the constitutional court, um, and the judges did not see this as sort of a failure, right? Um, the, the fact that the parties were able to reach some negotiation uh, and settle a, a dispute, um, was seen in some sense um, as, as, a, as a success because um, there isn't a presumption that um, adversarial nature of law is the only way in which law can function as, as a tool for change. So I will stop there um, because I know we have another panelist and we want to also have a space for, for questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So um, this is sort of a different talk than many of you heard me give at the law school before because this is a part of my career that I don't um, no longer uh, practice. But um, it was a very formative part of my career and I'm excited to have the opportunity to share it with you. Um, I clerked for Justice Blackman um, and uh, to use the lingo OT92, um, 
which was a unusually contentious year. It began with the confirmation process for Clarence Thomas, uh, Justice Thomas, and it ended with Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, so normally um, when, when clerks talk about these sort of things, there, there's a great confidentiality that goes along with it. I happen to be in a different position because after Black, Justice Blackman passed away, he made all of his papers public. Um, and this is probably one of the most important lessons I learned from my clerkship is be very uh, careful about what you put in writing. <laughs> <laughs> because the day after these papers were made public, I, I had a voicemail from Nina Totenberg <laughs> asking me what I meant in some of my memos. So in any event, um, it, it uh, was an eye-opening experience. I, I do want to start by confirming um, what Professor Allen said, we clerk for the same district court judge. Um, clerking is a unique experience, and I really do think regardless of whether you're in eventually practice law, and as you know, I don't uh, practice anymore, it's still an incredibly valuable experience to see how the law is made. And I suspect that similar experiences can be had in the executive and legislative branch. But I guess what, in terms of clerkships, it really doesn't matter if it's federal or state or na international. It doesn't matter if it's trial court or appellate. The most important thing is the nurturing relationship that you have with your judge. I mean, you should pick a clerkship based on the person and what you're going to uh, gain in personal lessons from that individual. Um, and so, you know, I have a student who recently graduated as a magistrate in the east end of Pittsburgh. I think it would be awesome to clerk for him. <laughs> so uh, take advantage of this opportunity because it's going to give you an insight into how you practice law far more than anything else you can do in your career. So Justice Blackmun is, of course, known as the author of Roe versus Wade. It's the opinion that came to define his life. It is not something that he ever um, asked to define his life. He was a very um, humble and shy man who uh, grew up in, in uh, difficult circumstances but managed to get a scholarship to go to Harvard. I think he was uh, the coxswain on the crew team. Um, then went on to be, uh, get into Harvard Law School, but he joked that the only reason he went to law school was because he couldn't get, get into med school. <laughs> so this is a man who never really envisioned himself as a Supreme Court justice, let alone um, a judge at all, um, but he was a, a very loyal Minnesotan, as he would pronounce it, and he went back to Minnesota, practiced law, was a tax lawyer, um, ended up working at the Mayo Clinic, which was probably the favorite job of his life because he got to work closely with doctors who he had tremendous respect for, and, um, and was appointed eventually to be a federal judge, but when it came time to be appointed for Supreme Court, he, he was actually, he referred to himself as old number three because three other, uh, two other judges appointed, um, uh, put forward by President Nixon were disqualified for various circumstances. So he was the compromise candidate and the reason he was chosen was because he grew up as a childhood friend of Chief Justice Warren Burger. Um, if you know the, the story of, of the Minnesota Twins, as they were uh, called, they actually, um, sadly, by the end of their life, were barely speaking to one another because they went on very different um, judicial career paths in terms of their philosophy. But they started out as very close friends, and, and that is why Justice Blackman was able to, um, to ascend to the Supreme Court. He was um, uh, probably, as, in addition to being Warren Burger's uh, childhood friend, he was the squeaky cleanest man you would ever uh, want to meet. He kept every receipt. He, he was one of the most meticulous individuals I've, I've ever met. Um, but he was also one of the kindest, most humble individuals I've ever met. I mean, he knew the name of every um, uh, janitor, every security guard. He knew their grandchildren. I mean, he, he really was... Um, the sort of the people's justice in the sense of he, he looked at the law, he looked at the people involved in the law before he even got to the law. He was a really, he was a, a true um, humble people person. Um, he was hardworking. Um, he, when I worked with him, he was 83 years old and he was still working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. Um, he was, um, you know, as I said, meticulous. He, he uh, wrote his own bench memos, although he never showed them to us. We also had to write bench memos, but he, uh, he, he kept his own. Um, and uh, he did all of his uh, 
blue booked every citation, shepherdized everything that we did. So I was on a number of occasions. He would tell me I missed something, um, and he was he was quite quite meticulous when it came to that. He was also um, very fun. He um, we were lucky in that after every conference at the court, he would come back and tell us exactly how everybody voted and what the reasons for doing so, and he would make the other justices the sounds of their voice. So we, we always looked forward to Fridays um, when he would come back. Um, in terms of you know what um, I learned from Justice Blackman, and again, this is all, you can go to the Library of Congress and read everything that um, uh, was ever written by Justice Blackman or his clerks. Um, there's also some excellent books that have been written, one by Lynn Greenhouse of the New York Times, um, and Tinsley Yarborough is actually probably a, a more objective biography um, in terms of it's less personal, more legal. Um, but it was, um, you know, I, I tried to focus sort of on my experience and what I, uh, what I gained from it that might be relevant to you no matter what you go on to do. And the first thing I, I would say is be nice to secretaries. Now, <laughs> you may think this is a ridiculous um, piece of advice, but it was what my mentor gave, the piece of advice he gave to me before I went to uh, interview with Justice Blackman. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous. My mother's a secretary. Why would I not be nice to secretaries? He said, just, just listen to what I'm telling you. So I go in. Justice Blackman and I, uh, before you get in, you get to spend time with this secretary. Well, Justice Blackman's secretary was like his daughter, and she was a wonderful woman. And you know, we immediately hit it off and remain friends to this day. Um, and I went in for my interview, and, and the interview seemed to go fine. At the end of it, um, I used to use the initials AJ in the middle of my name. And he said, why do you have two initials as I'm walking out the door? And I said, well, the second initial is Jude. It's my confirmation name. And he looked at me and he goes, you're Catholic. And I said, yes. And he goes, well, you may not know this, but I wrote Roe versus Way. <laughs> and I'm much like you, I burst out laughing. And then I thought, OK, I'm not supposed to be laughing at this. I said, no, it's OK. I'm Catholic. It's OK. I know you wrote it. It's really, I'm OK with it. Um, and so I left thinking I, I probably shouldn't have laughed, but you know, it took me by surprise. And, and thankfully, he, he had a sense of humor, and he, he chose me. Um, and uh, uh, the following year, there was a clerk from Harvard, because we got to interview the clerks for the following year, who was just brilliant. I mean, far, far more impressive than, than I was in terms of pure intellect. Um, he did not talk to the secretary. <laughs> And so we came after the, the day after we interviewed, um, Justice Blackman came to breakfast because we would eat breakfast together every morning in the public cafeteria and talk about the cases, which we were always sort of amazed that we were sitting in a public cafeteria talking about <laughs> Supreme Court cases. Um, but he said, you know, oh, he was just, he was so bright. I really liked him. I think he would fit in well. The next day he comes to breakfast, he says, Wanda didn't like him. <laughs> and that, that was the end of that clerk. <laughs> so um, be, uh, uh, extremely, you know, um, it's important. Secretaries, security guards, janitors, these are people who can change, you know, change your life in ways that you'll never know. So, and that was something that he very much cared about. Um, in terms of the, the procedure, our cert, we were part of the cert pool. Um, we still had you know, a significant number of cert petitions we had to, to write that we divvied up among the, our clerks and then among the chambers. Um, by far, the part of the job that I hated most were the death penalty cases, because at the time, Justice Blackman in 92 had not yet decided that um, capital punishment was per se cruel and unusual. So we were still there late at night having to make the call as to whether or not someone lived and died, and I hated it. Um, and I. I because I don't believe in capital punishment. I never recommended it, but he frequently overruled me. Um, so that was a, a very sobering experience. As I said, we had bench memos. Um, he he uh, wrote his own draft, so for every case, and it was very random. He did not pick and choose which clerks uh, got which opinions. It just happened to be that when your number was up, you got the next opinion. Um, uh, so you would write your own bench memo, which would include you know, tentative recommendations as to how you would rule. Now, the perception that somehow clerks are running the show is pretty ridiculous, because this is a man who had been on the bench for 20 years and um, had ruled on pretty much everything that was coming before us. 
Um, and the vast majority of Supreme Court cases are not that contentious. I mean, it, it's really the ones you hear about are the ones that are most contentious. But most of what we, you know, they're tax opinions, they're, uh, you know, uh, federal regulations. It's, um, it's not nearly as exciting as you think. But the one that, that um, you often hear about are those that are contentious. Um, and so the bench memos that, um, that we wrote uh, were then used by the justice to go into the oral arguments, which we were welcome to attend. We tended to attend the ones that we were assigned because the other ones often were very boring. <laughs> and you didn't want to go in and have to sit through those. Um, and our justice was one of the justices who, who did not ask a lot of questions. Some of the justices loved to ask questions, but uh, Justice Blackman rarely asked questions. So, you know, would write down all these questions asked. He would invariably never never ask him, and when he did ask a question, it was never the one you recommended. So it was, uh, it was he, he very much saw oral argument as an opportunity to listen, and he didn't like the fact when some justices act, asked a lot of questions. As I said, in conference, um, it was great because he would come back and tell us, and some of the other justices were not as open with their clerks about what um, the decision-making process was like, so invariably we'd have clerks from other chambers come to us and say, you know, my justice assigned me the opinion and told me which way to come down, but he didn't tell me, like, <laughs> who else was voting which way or what, you know. So we ended up, for, for some clerks, not just the Stevens, but some of the other uh, chambers, they would come to us to ask um, how the opinion broke down. Um, he would, in most cases, allow us to take the first crack on an opinion based on the bench memos, his and ours. Um, uh, the one exception is that he loved tax law. He would never make us do the tax law cases. He, he insisted that he got the tax law because he would, we would get it wrong if he left it to us. So <laughs> contrary to being this great sort of civil libertarian, his favorite cases were the tax law cases. Um, as I said, uh, the Planned Parenthood versus Casey is probably the case that most um, sticks with me, that experience, although for this I actually had to go back and reread re -read some of the opinions because it's been quite a while. Um, it was a fascinating case in the sense that uh, it uh, you know, flipped back and forth from, from uh, beginning to end and you never... Uh, even the, the sort of the granting of cert, this is, you know, the... the case that's going to decide the abortion issue. And the question initially was whether or not that case would be decided uh, prior to the election of um, uh, Bush versus Clinton. And so part from the very beginning, this was an unusual case in the degree to which it was politicized because some, some of the justices, um, it was our opinion, preferred to wait to have this decision made after the election because they didn't want um, to have to deal, uh, the president to deal with the political consequences. And they felt like this was a case that could well slay, um, sway the election. So we were in a situation where the case was continually relisted, which means that the judges would put off the cert petition for a week. Um, finally, Justice Blackman, who we knew at this point that, you know, assumed that they had the votes to overrule Roe. And so our, Justice Blackman's opinion was, well, if you're going to do it, I want you to do it before the election because I want people to have a chance to have an impact um, based on this. And so he finally threatened to write uh, an opinion um, uh, disagreeing with the relisting of the case. And that had never been done before. So at that point, they agreed to um, hear the case. It um, was heard in, um, I believe it was April. Uh, it was the last case of the year that was heard, and as you probably know, all Supreme Court cases have to be um, uh, handed down usually by July 4th. So it was a very compressed time period. They went into the conference. Um, it was clear that, um, that they had the votes to overrule Roe. However, um, Chief Justice Rehnquist and everyone but I think Justice Scalia felt like it wasn't necessary to overrule Roe to reach the results they had. That Justice O'Connor's undue burden test was, um, was sufficient to, to knock down these uh, regulations and they didn't have to reach the question of Roe. So Justice Blackmun came out saying, well, I'm gonna write a dissent that says, you know, they're not being honest about this. So they basically gutted Roe and if you're going to gut it, you need to be honest in your opinion as to what you're doing. Um, so that's the direction that the dissent was going. And it just so happened 
by the order that I was assigned the dissent, which is kind of ironic since I was the ca one practicing Catholic in the <laughs> chamber, but it's just sort of the way that it worked out. So um, I uh, um, got to work on the dissent, uh, and uh, Justice Rehnquist went off and started working on the majority opinion, but unbeknownst to any of us, Justice Souter, Justice Kennedy, and Justice O'Connor got together and decided that they were going to write an opinion together, which effectively upheld the, um, the, um, you know, the the basic premise of Roe, although it was more of an undue burden test. But it was certainly a, a shocking result given what we thought was going to happen, and it was also equally shocking to the Chief Justice, who thought he was writing the majority opinion. Um, he circulated, Chief Justice Rehnquist circulated his opinion, I think, on um, May 27th. On May 28th, we, uh, Justice Blackman gets a note from Justice Kennedy saying, I'd like to talk to you. Um, and uh, he goes into his chambers and uh, closes the door. And he comes out, and they say, they're not overturning it. <laughs> and so suddenly, our dissent, uh, we'd throw that away. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist had to throw his majority opinion away, and, and it was just a scramble after that. I mean, it was um, in a very short period of time. They tried very hard to get Justice Kennedy sw to switch back, and Justice Rehnquist was famous for taking walks around the court. Um, and we would look out the window and see Justice Rehnquist walking with Justice Kennedy, you know, trying to persuade him to flip. Um, Justice Scalia, who was also a Catholic, pressed upon Justice Kennedy that he should switch back because of his Catholic faith. So it was, it was a really, you know, we didn't know until the last day when the opinion was handed down what it was going to say. Um, and so there was a lot of, you know, we wanted to support the three justices, but obviously Justice Stevens and, and Justice Blackmun were more um, in line with Roe, but we, there was a lot of negotiating to make sure that we could sign on to as big a part of their opinions as we possibly could. Um, at the same time, you know, we were doing our best to spin the undue burden standard as strong as it could, so that you know, even though um, it wasn't the standard we liked, that it was still a standard with teeth that states had to fulfill this requirement. Um, at the same time, Chief Justice Rehnquist is writing a dissent, but he still won't admit that he's overruling Roe. He's still saying that that's not necessary, that that's not what. So we had to keep sort of hammering in our dissent, sort of pointing out the fact that he was, um, that we felt he wasn't being honest about what he wanted to do. Justice Scalia, on the other hand, is writing a, you know, one of his um, uh, very colorful opinions uh, comparing um, Justice Kennedy to Roger Taney and, <laughs> and Dred Scott. So it was, <laughs> we've got all of those opinions flying around. Um, and finally, on the, on the very last day, the chief said, OK, I'll admit it. I'll admit I'm doing it. Um, but that, he switched his opinion, which gave us one day to completely rewrite our dissent, because uh, we had completely written in another direction. So it was an exhausting process. And, and um, it's, it's been written about you know, significantly, which is why I can talk about it. But I'm happy to answer questions. But I will say that um, when I finished my clerkship, I was ready to leave DC. <laughs> It was just, um, and sadly, it, it has not changed much. It's a, it's a very political, um, adversarial place. And it was a shame, because again, most of the cases that we worked on uh, were not like that. But that particular case just uh, burned us all out. Um, but it did teach me that you know, you, ideally, you want to you know, be in a relationship with the other chambers that allows you, and, it, and to a certain extent it happened, except for this case, to know that you may not agree with someone on this case, but on the very next case you may be allies. And that's what happened in this case. We assumed that we were going to be writing the dissent, and instead we ended up um, uh, completely changing uh, what we had to do. And, and there were many other cases where we were on the same side as Justice Scalia, or we were on the opposite side of <coughs> Justice O'Connor. So it's important, I think, I, the one uh, lesson I think I did take was the importance of trying to maintain those alliances, because you're in a very close-knit relationship. And it's important that um, long-term you, you build those relationships. So. <laughs> So we have some time, a few minutes, for questions. We can run a little bit over our 6.30. And so uh, we envision this as 
some conversation, and I'm sure some of you have some questions, so don't be shy. Um, I'll repeat the question for the sake of the video, but shout it out. Anybody? Yes. So the question is based on their experience, how do they feel about lifetime appointment for the Supreme Court justices? Should I, should I take, I'll take it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. So of course, having worked for somebody who is 82 when I worked for him, and then of course he worked well past that. Um, I have to say my experience is that, you know, you never know how some folks will age. Justice Stevens, I want to say this genuinely, I mean, he, he was amazing. I had no idea. You know, if you had just run into Justice Stevens on the street, you would have no idea he was 82. Uh, he was at, you know, sort of full capacity, if you will, and more. Um, the only thing that gave Justice Stevens away was his arthritis in his hands. So if you looked at his hands, you knew. Um, and then a little bit later, he had some hearing loss. And that's when people thought, oh, Justice Stevens is losing it. And actually, he just needed hearing aids. And then he was fine. Um, so he, he, has, he was you know, really remarkable. And I don't know that that's, uh, the th that's what we should expect. Of course, a lot of my good friends have written, written quite a bit about whether there should be term limits on justices and whether that would be um, OK, and, and especially given our experience. And so I'm going to mention both Justice Douglas and Justice Marshall. Um, there are some uh, more is known about Justice Douglas than Justice Marshall, but they both, towards the end of their time on the Supreme Court, had some serious ailments. Um, and in fact, uh, in the last years of Justice Douglas being on the court, I think it's very well known that you know if there was a tie, the court would rehear the case um, because he could never be the deciding vote. That's what they decided, right? Um, and so they, the court has really managed that internally, and and you, you could ask some questions about whether that's the right practice. So I think the advocates of uh, you know some kind of limit there. Um, you know, what, what should we do uh, to prevent that kind of thing from happening? It's a very, very tough question. Um, uh, one of my friends uh, has suggested that maybe we could introduce uh, circuit riding again and maybe have everybody actually get back on horses. Um, and that would really eliminate the number of people who are staying past 80. Um, I'm not sure that's quite what we would need to do. Uh, but I think it's worthy of serious consideration because we do know that as people age, um, they, it, things get much more difficult. But I also want to say that there are some truly extraordinary human beings in this world. And I just happen to have been around one of them. I, and it was kind of ironic, right? My, my grandmother, when I was working, uh, my grandmother was a little bit younger than Justice Stevens. She couldn't do all the things that he was doing, right? So it was, it's a, it's a pretty unusual set of folks, and I don't know, right, uh, exactly what the equation should be. But I certainly think that it's worth considering, given that we've had some of these justices that haven't done as well in office, and what to do in those circumstances. Um, I mean, I also worked for a justice who who worked until his 80s. He only lasted, I think, two years after me, and you could. He was literally, I think he was he was ready to go, but he was hanging on because he felt like he needed to to protect the cases he cared most about. Um, I mean, it would, I assume, and it's been so long since I've looked at this, it would be in a constitutional amendment probably to have to do this. Um, and I think that there are provisions for impeaching judges that I think could be used um, to some degree to try to deal with this. Um, again, Justice Blackman was amazing, so I think in his particular case it worked. But yes, I think when he, when he got to 84 and 85, he knew that it was time for him to move on. So in, in the Canadian context, we've decided that discretion is the better part of valor. So actually, Canadian Supreme Court justices uh, will retire at 75. Um, and in part, uh, that was done because of a negative experience that we had had with several Supreme Court judges uh, in the 1980s and late 70s. 
Um, and and I uh, had the honor, uh, I suppose, of, of, of knowing one of the individuals concerned uh, who had a wonderful legal record and was an incredible mind, but, but then in his later years became very dysfunctional on the court to the extent that his clerks were basically carrying him, not physically, but intellectually and, 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 and doctrinally, uh, and nobody wanted that to, to happen again. At the same time, changing the rules in the Canadian context was easier, it was accomplished legislatively, um, there wasn't a constitutional amendment or anything else required uh, to do that, but we've been happy with the, um, the consequences. I think we have had some missed opportunities as a result with judges who are, are very good late uh, into their years. But of course, we also know, given my own experience with Justice Ledain, that uh, justices can have difficulty, significant difficulty prior uh, to coming up to the age of 75. So it's a different approach. Um, I'm not sure which one is better, but at least there are alternatives. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, South Africa, I mentioned while I was there, four of the judges left, right? And so there isn't a presumption of sort of staying on until the very end that's inbuilt there within, uh, I think the judicial, maybe I guess practice is this idea that you retire and that you let um, new people come in, fresh ideas and the like. Um, and so judges will often um, rotate off, even the apex court before it's time for them to do so um, and, and, and don't um, sort of hang on um, until they're um, untimely deaf or anything like that. Other questions? Yes, Lord. So the question for the video is uh, whether, in considering whether to retire or not, uh, Supreme Court justices think about the politics of how they'll be replaced and by whom. Yes. <laughs> that's pretty easy, right? Yes, I just think that that's, that's sort of the nature of this now. Uh, I think that there could have been a different uh, sort of way to approach this question. Um, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, but it's just not true today. So to be very honest, right, politics really matter in terms of justices, and we know that. It's a much more divided court than it ever was before. And so politics in terms of stepping down, as well as, you know, who's gonna get on there, plays a huge role. So, so did you want to say? Oh. Quickly. Um, so again, the Canadian situation is different. Um, uh, the court is much more politically homogeneous. Uh, there are differences of opinion, obviously, but they don't tend to be on, on massive party lines or partisan lines. At the same time, we are new at this game. Uh, because we only recently developed a, a, a system of, of judicial supremacy, uh, we have not yet fully come to grips with the fact that the stakes are as high as they are. Uh, on the court. So if you give us another 30 to 50 years, um, it may be that our justices will be much more conscious of their replacements. But at the moment, they don't tend to think about this. Uh, yes, the, 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 the appointment process is somewhat politicized because the prime minister makes the recommendation to staff the court. But once you're there, you're basically deemed to be non-political and it's hard to break down the, uh, the justices on, on, on obvious party lines at this juncture. So the question is, what should Pitt students be doing and thinking about if they want to position themselves to get a clerkship? Well, I don't, I don't want to do the entire clerkship spiel here. Um, I, I, I tend to go on and on because you saw I have uh, three clerkships and I wish, uh, I keep asking a district judge in Utah if he'll hire me because yeah. I haven't done a district court clerkship yet. Um, he hasn't given me the job yet. Um, uh, so I looked around for another one. Here I am. Uh, so anyway, I just think uh, when you're thinking about clerking, first of all, if I could just join the chorus of how special the experience is and how unique it is and the amount of law that you learn in that year 
or so with a judge or justice is just incredible. Um, I, you don't get paid as much as you might get paid for other opportunities, I get it. Um, but it is one of the most important experiences in my life and I'm gonna go even farther. I have a daughter, so don't, let's not tell her this yet. The best year of my life was clerking at the US Supreme Court. She was not born yet, but uh, and and it's still the best year of my life. Um, but uh, you know that it is a really, really special thing. And I, if I could advocate for one thing, it's for people to think about judicial clerkships in lots of different places and spaces. The one thing that I will tell you you need, so just so everybody's out there thinking about this, is a writing sample, and you need that kind of early in the game because uh, the clerkships tend to come up a little bit earlier in your law school career. So if you're thinking about this, to have a good sample, a good writing sample, and um, I'm sure all of us could tell you what might be a, a good writing sample here, what it would consist of, but basically you have to have that sort of in the bag. Um, I recommend that people get that somehow through a seminar or other kind of paper-based class um, in the second year, so you're well prepared to apply for clerkships. As far as other things, some federal judges require you to take fed courts, so you may have to get that in the constellation of things, and there's some trial judges, and this may not be as true, here, um, or even as true as it was when I was uh, going through this, but there were some trial judges that wanted to be sure you had taken evidence and a couple of other really practical things so that you would know what was going on for trial judge experience. Um, but other than that, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a wide open space, and so I would encourage everybody to consider them. And it doesn't matter where you are in the class, it doesn't matter, there, there is an opportunity out there. Um, depending on your interest and what, where you want to go uh, in terms of geography. Carrie, you have the last question. Um, in my first year of law school, I had given a lecture by Professor Chu here uh, on judicial bias, and in particular, her scholarship showed that there is uh, racial gender bias and maybe other kinds of bias. Uh, in your experience working with the high court judges, can you speak about So the question is, uh, in working with judges on the high courts, did you observe bias, racial or gender, gender bias on the part of the court? Were the, were the judges themselves aware or concerned, perhaps, about that issue? Too. Um, so I think uh, justices are of a certain age. So I think we have to just acknowledge that. Like when I was there, the in, you know, in 2002, you're not going to believe this, right? The internet was not the same thing as it is today. And so we had some very classic lines that might have been thrown around by certain justices. I won't name the justice who said, but isn't the internet for porn? And we thought, well, that, that's not quite, you might want to go, like, and that, the irony is that that justice does some other kinds of things now, right, um, that actually involve website. Anyway, um, so I just think that you have to say that this group of folks, you know, does this group of folks look any different than that sort of age, right? And I think you see that in terms of bias, in terms of technology, in terms of a lot of the knocks on the Supreme Court, given that you have people at a certain age. So the real question is their willingness to understand these different things. Um, do we have an implicit bias training at the Supreme Court? They didn't have one when I was there. I don't know if Chief Justice Roberts has instituted one. I sure think that would be a good idea, right, if you're thinking about the demographics and what people might know or might not know about their biases. Um, now, I worked uh, at, you know, for Justice Stevens. I can tell you there was never a moment where I felt that he was biased, and in fact, um, I thought he went out of his way to ensure that he treated everyone equally and fairly. Um, did I witness other bias? Um, the, the difficult thing when I was there was not really among the justices and the clerks. It was among the staff and the justices and the clerks, right? So what you may not know about the Supreme Court is that most of the janitors who worked there for a very long time were African-American. And the justices obviously were mostly white. 
And in fact, most of the staff working for the justices were white. Um, and uh, when Justice Stevens came from Chicago, he wanted to take the person who served as his head secretary with him to the Supreme Court, and she agreed. Her name was Anne. And um, when uh, he took Anne from Chicago to DC, what she did not realize is that she would be the first and only African American head secretary. And uh, some of the things that I would say were very racialized at the Supreme Court, I witnessed not necessarily in the interactions between the justices or their clerks, but was this other sort of group of folks in the staff. Most of that by 2002 was not there, but you could certainly feel the remnants of that. Anybody else want to take a crack at that one? Um, the Justice Blackman By the time um, I got to Justice Blackman, it's probably no surprise that he had a significant uh, number of women clerks. Um, and my year, um, I'm trying to think, it was three women, two men. Um, uh, I will tell you a funny story, but he's, he's 80 years old, and he's certainly the year before he had a, a clerk of color. But my mentor um, was Harold Coe, who's Korean. and. Harold t tells this hysterical story where the justice, when he was clerking for him, used the term oriental. And so justice, he took Justice Blackman aside and said, you should, you know, the term is Asian. And he was, you know, very, very kind about it. And and so they, soon after that, they were walking and they passed a rug store. And Justice <laughs> Blackman <laughs> said, I love that Asian rug. <laughs> so he perhaps went, <laughs> But, but no, I mean, you do have to come, you know, deal with the fact that these are older, or older gentlemen, at least in my case. But he was, you know, he was incredibly, um, he had uh, only daughters, and his wife was a very um, uh, imposing person as well, uh, just a delight. But he, he definitely had more than uh, the usual number of female clerks. So, yeah, I'll, I'll just comment. I mean, I was working in a different uh context, but uh, even still, I mean, I think that the idea of um, bias is not something that necessarily has to be invidious, right? It can just be people operating from priors or implicit uh, biases that end up um, having uh, an impact that's detrimental to uh, historically subordinated groups. So whether I saw invidious discrimination or something like that, no. Um, whether I saw people using sort of priors or stereotypes to understand a particular situation, perhaps. Were they aware of that? I don't know. I mean, I think that um, on the court itself, it was far more progressive in terms of demographics, in terms of the number of women on the constitutional court. Uh, we had an openly um, LGBT identifying individual. We had an HIV and AIDS identifying individual on, on the court. So um, in terms of apex courts, uh, and, and, and questions of, of representativity. I don't think that that was a huge issue, as huge an issue on the um, South African court as um, perhaps maybe others. But that said, I think that um, you know institutions are still functioning in a society and, and it, it cannot be the case that uh, the sort of quote unquote rainbow nation or whatever that it was supposed to come after apartheid uh, meant that all divisions in society sort of evaporated. And so you saw some of that reflected on the court whether or not that was um, sort of done purposely or not, I don't think that, that that's the case. But history is is lived and continues to be lived um, and experienced. And so I think that that is what um, was, was more present. I would say that um, in relation to the other question, the court in South Africa tends to be a little bit more homogenous. I, I mentioned that most people are from sort of a struggle background uh, that are sitting on, on the court. And so you have less of um, not that there isn't disagreement, there are, but you have less um, sort of dissenting opinions. The, the model is we need to have consensus and we need to have unanimity. And if, if there's a dissent, it's like, oh my God, there's a dissent. Um, whereas here, obviously, <laughs> you know, we, we live for the dissents, um, <laughs> right? That's, that's where the, the juice is. Um, so, <laughs> so um, you know, it, I think it's also just a different political, political culture. Um, and so I think bias is something that is a part of human society and so reflects any institution that has humans in it. 
maybe that's not the most um, uplifting note to end on. Well, I think, <laughs> I think, I think it's a, both a realistic and an uplifting yeah. note. And so join me in thanking our panelists. And go out there and get clerkships. <laughs>